Welcome to the Super Abundant Life Podcast, where we teach the Bible in a simple, authentic, and practical way so that Christians can skillfully apply the Word of God to create supernatural results in every area of life. This is your host, Olaomi Bridgway. Today I'm going to be talking about something that is so important, but is also very common, especially amongst us Pentecostals. And it's about dismissing warning signs and not being adequately prepared for the storm. So what I'm going to be sharing with you today are two areas. The first one is why you shouldn't do that. (laughs) And secondly, I'm going to give you a clear strategy to follow in order to be adequately prepared for anything that may hit you. We don't want to live from crisis to crisis. If you are the kind of person that adopts an ostrich mentality, you just, there's so many warning signs, there's so many things that are appearing to you in your environment, and you just feel like, no, 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 and you ignore them or dismiss them outright, then that person would end up living from crisis to crisis because they will always be overrun, right? They will always be overrun. I'm taking my text from John chapter 13, and it's a very small part of John chapter 13. And I will look at that. And then to teach further, I will look into other areas of the Bible. So just to give you some context, John chapter 13 is when Jesus begins to talk about his crucifixion, the fact that he must go to the cross and he demonstrated servanthood. The Bible talks about how he took off his robe, put a towel around himself, and then began to wash the disciples' feet. So there's a lot packed into John chapter 13. But what I wanted to talk about specifically today is the part where Jesus was talking to disciples and he was saying, okay, this is what's going to happen, the crucifixion, etc. And then he said that one of you is going to betray me. So they were like, "Eh? who? Is it you? Is it you? Is it me? So they were like, "Ah, what do you mean we're going to betray you? And he went specifically to Peter, Simon Peter, and Jesus said specifically to Simon Peter, you are going to deny me. And he said, no, oh God, no, no, no. I said, I will, I'm going to die with you, Jesus. I'll go with you anywhere and whatever. And Jesus said, oh, it's like a emo. If you know what that means, a emo. See this one. Before the cock crows, you have denied me three times. So that is a part that I'm going to take out of John chapter 13. But I like the way Matthew 26 gives the account because it fleshes it out a bit more so i'm going to be teaching from matthew 26 okay today i'm talking about why you shouldn't dismiss warning signs and how to always make sure you are adequately prepared for any storm that may be heading your way let me read and then i will begin to break it down and teach based on that matthew 26 31 says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee, etc. So Jesus basically shows up to these guys and says, listen, this is what's coming. There's a huge storm that is coming. There's a season where you must prepare yourself well. Peter now immediately speaks up and he says, even if everyone deserts you, I, Peter, will never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you would deny three times that you even know me. 35. No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. First of all, why would Peter do that? I mean, if this is Jesus, the Messiah, talking to someone that you respect very highly and is telling you, I'm telling you, this is what's going to happen. What made Peter and the other disciples just dismiss it? Like, I reject it. Especially with us Pentecostals. This thing is very common with us. We're very quick to say, I reject it. They say, oh, they're firing people. They're laying people off in your work. We say, I reject it in Jesus' name. I'm not saying you should not reject it. (laughs) I'm not saying you should not counter things. I'm a word person. All right. I understand the power of words. So when words are spoken, you must counteract words and you must say, no, I reject that in the name of Jesus. However, that I reject it in Jesus' name is a cliche for most people. They don't even understand what they're saying. It's just an automatic response 
So like, no, 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 God forbid, no, God forbid, it won't happen to me. But what makes you so special that it won't happen to you? That is a question you should really be asking yourself. So if you've happened to find out that they're laying people off at work or they're planning to reshuffle the department and certain jobs will go and you automatically say, I reject that in Jesus name. And then you move on. I mean, what makes you exempt? The thing you are saying, is it actually backed by something or you are just doing Christianese? Unfortunately for a lot of us, particularly Pentecostals, it's just Christianese. It's just an automated response. You just say, I reject it. You say one, one out of every two marriage will feel, say, I reject it, my marriage will not feel. What have you prepared? What is the backing of that thing that you are saying that it will not happen to you? The people that it is happening to, are you better than them? You understand what I'm saying? So first of all, we have to humble ourselves because we're so quick to think, no, I'm exempt. What exempts you? What exempts you? If they say one out of every two marriage will crumble, even including Christians. But people are still going into marriage and not actually thinking, why is it that marriages crumble and how can I make sure that it doesn't happen to me? But human nature, and to answer the question that I asked in the beginning, why would Peter and the other disciples automatically dismiss the warning sign that Jesus was giving them? That there's a storm coming and that storm is going to sweep them if they don't actually do something about it. Why is that? Because we always think that bad things will happen to other people, to them, not to us. You understand what I'm saying? You never think as humans, yes, human nature is always a them and me kind of thing. If you say, oh, uh, something is going to happen, you say, oh, no, it's them, it's not me. But what makes you so sure? And what makes the people that it's happening to worse than you? What makes you better? You can't just speak and say, I reject it, move on, and not actually sit down to think, okay, is there any merit to that thing? Have you checked your heart to make sure that you're truly grounded in what you're saying? They say one out of every three will get cancer. Say, I reject it in Jesus' name. Have you sat down to establish your own heart regarding divine healing and divine health? Before you are, so you just say, I reject, I reject, I reject it. But the heart is empty when it comes to having faith concerning that. Thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? So human nature is to think, oh, it can never happen to me. Even though all around you is happening to people, we are not better. So it takes humility, first of all. Peter was like, no, 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 it can never happen to me. Me, I would follow you wherever you're going, even to death. So he automatically thought, all oh, these ones can deny you, but me, I can never deny you. So he overestimated his own strength. What he should have done when Jesus said that was, ah, Lord, really? And then sit down and then begin to reflect and think, what is the state of my heart? Right? But because he was so quick to dismiss it, his life was almost destroyed because Jesus went on to say that Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. Satan really was going to try and destroy Simon the way he destroyed Judas. It was exactly the same MO. If not for the intercession of Jesus for Peter, Peter would have been destroyed. That falling for that temptation, he probably would have killed himself too. Because I hope you understand that they both did the same thing. They both betrayed Jesus. In different ways one was motivated by money which was judas one was motivated by fear of men fear of consequences but they still did exactly the same thing and jesus tried to warn peter but he wouldn't hear it unfortunately storms will come i'm telling you so if you just keep walking through life as if oh nothing bad can ever happen to me it is a prideful way to view life it is proud to think, oh, it's only, it's, it's, it can't be me. The people that are getting it, you're not better than them. You understand what I'm saying? It is a very prideful way to walk through life thinking, oh, it's other people that can get cancer. It's other people that can be fired. It's other people. Have you not seen wonderful people die of cancer? And I'm not trying to be morbid. So I've come specifically to help us not just automatically respond and say, I reject it. Oh, God forbid. And you move on without actually dealing with that thing. So I want to walk you through what Peter actually should have done. And I'm going to teach. So like I said, why you shouldn't dismiss warning signs. 
let me read what happens later on. So I'm going to skip forward. I'm reading from Matthew 26, 69. It says, meanwhile, so after they had taken Jesus, meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came over and said to him, you were one of those with Jesus, the Galilean. But Peter denied it <laughs> in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about. Say, eh, me, Peter, Jesus. No, I've never seen the man before in my life. Later, out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said to those around him, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it, this time with an oath. He didn't only just say, I don't know him. He began to swear, I swear by God in heaven. <laughs> Can you imagine? He didn't know how deep that thing went. He just thought, I've been following Jesus. There's no way I'm ever going to deny him. He didn't just say, I don't know. He began to swear. You don't know what's really inside you. And storms will come to expose to you what is truly inside you. You understand? So he says, by an oath, I don't even know this man. A little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. We can tell by a Galilean accent. Peter swore. A curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know this man. And immediately the rooster crowed. Suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you would deny me three times that you even know me. And he went away weeping bitterly. You can see that because he would not listen, he was not adequately prepared. If he had listened to Jesus, he would have thought, if we're trying to measure this thing, where my heart is in terms of generally wanting to die with Jesus, how likely am I to follow through with it? But pride made him think, no, no, no. All the other disciples can betray you, but I will never betray you. When I moved to this country in 2003, right, I was very slim, even though, you know, I was pregnant. So I pretty much only carried in my belly. So I had my baby like a few weeks afterwards. I went to see an auntie of mine who had lived here for so many years. I showed up there and she saw that ah, this one that just had baby. You're very slim. What's going on? I said, oh, that's just the weight. She said, ah, she just like, you know, you moved and said, don't worry. Very soon you would have gained weight because everybody that comes here gains weight. Now, do you know what my reaction to that was? My reaction was like, never. I can never gain weight. I'm slim. That's it. I know how to control my appetite, etc., etc. This was literally a, a few weeks, like a couple of weeks after I moved into the country. Now, here's what I'm saying. This is somebody that had lived in the UK for many years. She had seen people come and go. She had seen the trends, right? And she had noticed that the trend is no matter how slim you come into this country, if you don't take certain deliberate steps, you will soon gain weight. Why? Because number one, you're changing environment. I remember back in Nigeria to buy chocolate, you had to literally get in your car and maybe drive somewhere to some confectionery. You can't just, just like proper chocolate or cake or things like that. But this one just literally come out of your house. It's available. You say you want to, back in Nigeria, in, back then anyway, you want to eat chicken and chips. You had to maybe get in your car and drive to Ireland, drive miles to go and buy something. Like, it just was not readily. So junk food was not readily available. This was someone that was basically trying to tell me, be aware of your new environment. But what did I do? I responded with pride. I was like, no, 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 auntie, auntie, no, no. I'm going to even lose some more weight. Six months from that time, I don't know how many dress sizes I had gained. And so I sat down because I don't let things just pass in my life like that. I'm a very reflective person. So I sat down and I was thinking that this woman told me this thing. Why didn't I listen to her? Why did I just dismiss it? You understand what I'm saying? If I had listened, I would have said, oh, really? Tell me more. Why is it that when people move to the UK, most of them, if not all of them, start to gain weight? Or when people, whatever it is, or when people have kids, whatever the case might be. That is what my approach towards what she said should have been. So when you dismiss trends, what you are really saying is I'm better than the people that it is happening to. It's pride. Honestly, it is pride. When you begin to see things, especially if you're going into a new season of your life, you're about to get married. They say one out of every two marriages fail. Don't just go and say, oh, my own marriage is anointed of God. The angel Gabriel was the one that showed up to me and showed me who my husband is. And Jesus is the one that joined us together. And he starts saying all these things. Meanwhile, 
you haven't actually considered why is it that marriages fail. No matter how much you try to exempt yourself, if you have not made adequate preparation, you are not exempted. The thing will catch you. That's the truth. I'm telling you that is the way this world operates. And Jesus said storms will come. I don't care who you are. He said in this world, you will have tribulation. Things will come after you. Jesus talked about the two houses that were built. He said there were two houses that were built. The storm came. Now, if the guy who built his house on the sand, somebody had come and said, listen, in this area where you guys are building your house, the storm normally comes and he's like oh me storm the storm can never come to me and he didn't hear and as a result of that he dismissed it and decided the storm can never come to me and he went and built his house on the sand the storm came anyway but the one that had heeded that's why jesus said the man that built his house on the rock is the one that heard heeded my warning Everything I said and did it prepared adequately so that when the storm came, it didn't even shake it. Meanwhile, the one that ignored the warning and went on to do what he was going to do anyway and built his house on the stand, the storm came and swept him away. Warning signs are for your own benefit. Jesus tells us about the Holy Spirit that he would tell you of things to come. An angel does not need to appear to you for you to know of things to come. The Holy Spirit will show you by promptings. You just feel like mm, this thing feels a bit off. But he also expects us to do due diligence. If he has a project managers amongst us, if you're going to work on any project, one of the first things you do, you have to do due diligence to, you know, survey the environment and look at, okay, what are the opportunities? What are the threats? What are the things that could happen? Why don't we do that for our own personal lives? Why don't we do that? So, for example, when my son was going into secondary school, like a few years, two to three years prior to him going, I sat and I thought, what are the things that normally catch children <laughs> when they get to secondary school? What are the things that he will have to deal with when he gets to secondary school? Don't say, oh, my child is covered by the blood of Jesus. Da, 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 da. And you don't prepare the child. Which blood of Jesus? As you are saying it, your heart is condemning you. That statement it's not coming from a heart that is rooted. It's coming from just automatically responding without any substance behind it. So I said, he's going to secondary school. What are the things that he may contend with? So things like not being organized. So things like peer pressure. You understand? So I, I began to say, how do we prepare him in advance for that season of his life? You cannot skip the preparation period. So four steps that will help you be adequately prepared for any storm. You are not exempt from storms. I'm sorry. I wish I could come here and then encourage you and say, because you're a child of God, you are automatically exempt from storms. Nothing bad will come against you. I wish I could tell you that, but I would be invalidating or trying to invalidate what Jesus himself said. Jesus said the storm will come. He said you will face affliction. Okay. He said, if you are my disciples, you will face affliction. So it's about being adequately prepared in order to overcome that affliction. It's not supposed to swallow us up. If we dismiss it, that is actually when it swallows up. Let me finish up with the story of Peter and Jesus. Now let's see, this is what Jesus was trying to get Peter to do. So Jesus basically said to him, you're going to betray me. He said, I'm not going to betray you. Jesus repeated, said, I'm telling you, Oga, uncle, listen well. By the time the pressure mounts, you will cave. Peter said, no, I will not cave. I will even die with you. Jesus said, okay, we have told you. Now, because Jesus is such a merciful father, he didn't leave it. Do you know what Jesus went and did? He called them and said, let's go and pray. That was a preparation. He was still trying to tell, I'm telling you, this thing is coming. Go and pray. Go and pray. Go and pray. They were sleeping. So what did Jesus do? Jesus took it upon himself to go through with that preparation. He later on said, Satan has sought to sift you, Peter, like wheat, but I have prayed for you so that you will overcome. If Jesus had not prayed for him, that would have been his own end too. All right. So second half of this, I'm going to give you four steps, four things about how you can be adequately prepared for a storm so that the storm 
does not sweep you away, but you outlast every storm, whatever season of your life you're in. And I'm going to use the story of the 10 virgins, which is in Matthew 25. It says that the kingdom of heaven is likened to 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Remember, Jesus said that the foolish man builds his house on sand. The wise one builds his house on the rock. It's all about the preparation that happens before the storm comes. It says the five who were foolish didn't take enough oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were aroused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. And the foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some oil because our lamps are going out. Now, it's a very simple matter. Look at this. They were going into a situation. Now, they just assumed, they just assumed, not because of anything just assumed that everything would go their way they did not consider any kind of scenario except that it will go exactly their way do you know actually this is why people don't venture into things because fear will hold you back but if you have walked through the whole thing in your mind and you said what is the worst that can this is a strategy that i actually use in my life yeah you say oh it's lack of faith no it's not lack of faith in fact this is faith so I, I asked myself, I'm doing this thing. What is the worst that can hit me, that can come against me? What is the worst that can happen? Because once you identify the worst that can happen and you walk through it with God and you have a solution that if this happens, I know how to respond. Do you know what? You become so free. You can move forward and run ahead as you want. But that fear of the unknown, because you haven't sat down to really think of what could happen, just that you become so afraid that you can't really move forward. So when they saw the other five, right, getting extra oil, that was the warning sign that they needed, that this guy could be delayed. But they probably thought, no, 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 no. The bridegroom assured me personally. I spoke to him just before he went to the church and he assured me personally that he was going to be on time hmm? and as a result of that they were not adequately prepared but the five other ones thought do you know what the worst case scenario is that this guy becomes delayed and we run out of oil even if it does not happen we're going to make sure that we are adequately prepared it's better to be over prepared than under prepared you understand what i'm saying yeah so i'm going to walk you through the four strategies, the four steps that you should take in making sure that you are adequately prepared for any storm so that you can overcome that storm. Number one is identify the trends regarding that situation. Don't ever dismiss trends. Sit down and identify, make sure you collect enough information. Identify the trends. Like I said in the beginning, when my auntie told me that the trend was that when people moved to the UK because of the availability of all the junk food and how easy it is, people tend to gain weight. I should not have dismissed that trend. You understand? You have to identify it. Identify the trend. Say, marriages fail. One out of two will fail. You have to say, ah, okay, that's a really high trend. How can I fortify my own marriage? So sit down and identify. You're starting a new job. Have you scanned that environment? Have you looked at what generally, what could be the kind of storms that could come against you? So that's the first one. So the five virgins, the foolish ones, should have thought, what could possibly go wrong? You can't just assume now this is what people are doing they're not basing their faith on what god told them that listen your own marriage will never feel and they're established in it no they're just assuming that it will not happen it's not my portion it's not my portion why is it not your portion the people that is their portion are you better than them that's what i'm trying to say you can't just dismiss it and say it's not my portion why will it not be your portion there has to be substance backing up what, what you're saying. So the virgin should have looked at what could possibly go wrong. Even if the bridegroom personally assured me that he will be on time, maybe his car can break down, right? So what could stop me from being successful if this storm hits? 
that's number one number two is you now sit down with the holy spirit because you want to identify the one that actually concerns you you want to be more specific so for example when my auntie said what she said i'll sit down and say oh okay so the trend is people tend to gain weight then i sit down and say right holy spirit how does this apply to me what could trip me up you understand what i'm saying so you start with the general what are the trends marriages tend to fail one in three will get cancer those are the trends then the second step is you now bring it to you with in reflection with the holy spirit how does this apply to me what are the things in my life currently that could trip me up and cause a storm to sweep me away okay step two is identify what applies to you personally regarding that situation because you can't deal with every eventuality you can't you can identify and be aware of them but in terms of preparing for it so what peter should have said next after jesus said you would deny me would have been ah why would i deny you can you please do what is, what exactly is the problem that will cause me to deny you? and jesus would have told him that your strength is small so in conversation jesus would have started to show him all these things that in your heart even though you are following me up and down up and down up and down huh? you don't truly truly believe i'm the messiah enough for you to die for me the time is coming where that will be the case but right now you still don't believe it so you have to go into the place of prayer to strengthen you see do you understand what i'm saying so if you had actually listened the next step would have been okay so what could trip me up right i gave the example of my son going to secondary school my daughter is going to university in september i didn't start today and i definitely won't wait until september to think oh what are the possible challenges i should face this is a conversation that I've had and sat down in reflection with the Holy Spirit years before. That going to university, what are the possible things? I think about my own life when I went to university. I think about all the different things. And then I now say, concerning this particular child and this particular environment, what are the things that could cause a storm to sweep away? So you will sit down and you identify that specifically to the best of your knowledge. And then you entrust the rest to God. But you can't just go bare-chested and not be prepared at all. Number three, once you've identified the things that could trip you up, you now need to brainstorm a strategy. How can I deal with this thing if it comes up? With the virgins, for example. When they saw that, oh, it's possible that this guy could be delayed as a result of that, what would that mean? How can that trip us up? It would mean that we'll run out of oil. So you literally go and create a strategy. How am I going to make sure that if this thing happens, if it happens, what am I going to do? How will I respond? So you need a plan. All right. Create a plan of how you are going to respond to meet that challenge. Should it come at this point, there are no guarantees. You don't know whether it's going to come or not, but you cannot move through life thinking and assuming that it won't come. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So number three is what is the plan? How are you going to mitigate against that situation if it arises? So Peter, Jesus just told you that you are going to deny him, right? And he told you specifically what the plan of Satan was. When you find yourself in that situation, should you find yourself in that situation, how are you going to respond? What is the plan? You understand that? So you need a plan. Huh? And the last one is begin to prepare. Make preparations so that you're not inadequately prepared when that thing happens. The two people that built their house, they had been told that the storm was coming. The storm comes to everyone. You cannot avoid storms in life. But you can be prepared enough for you to overcome the storm and still be standing after it has passed. So the two people building their houses knew that the storm was coming. One dismissed it and carried on anyway. The one that was wise thought if the storm comes and I've researched it and I now know how strong that storm is going to be, how can I make sure that the storm doesn't sweep me away? He said, oh, okay, let me build a foundation that is strong enough. That's the plan. Then the fourth step is actually follow through and put something in place. So he actually built his house 
on the rock. Yeah? So he built his house on the rock. I gave the example, so I'm giving several examples so that this is clear. My son going to secondary school, as a secondary school teacher, for many years, I knew what would trip people up. So that's the first one, trends. I'm not going to automatically say, well, we are pastors. My son is the son of a pastor and he's spiritual and the blood of Jesus covers him. And I'm saying all those things. And I just completely dismiss. No, 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 no. Trends. I've seen trends. So one of the trends that I identify, so I, I listed all the different trends, but one specifically, yeah, that I identified was how children, so playing games, for example, it, and I matched it with the child. You understand what I'm saying? So step one is going to secondary school from my own experience, from all the trends, what are the things that could trip this child up? Yeah. Number two, specifically, so I cannot prepare for every eventuality. It's impossible. You have to entrust some things to God. So I say out of all these trends and things that could that trip children up when they go to second school, which one specifically with what I know of this child, which one specifically could play a major role that could be a storm that would shake him. Yeah. And one of the things I identified in step two was games playing games. I realized that kids, if they are playing a lot of games, a lot of games, a lot of games, after a while, that is all they want to do. It affects their homework. They don't want to do anything else. And after a while, they are so engrossed in the games that they'll play till early hours of the morning. They come to school tired. These were all things that I had to deal with. And the older the child gets, the less control the parents have. So by the time the child is like 15, GCSEs are coming. All right. The mother is saying, put the games away. The child won't listen again because when he was 10, when you could have taken the games away, you could have done it then. So I identify and I said, right, games, TV, excessive TV, watching all those things. I identify that. And then I said, what are the, the next one is what's the plan? How can I prepare in advance? Right. So I thought I don't want games in my house, even though he's a boy. And usually it might be normal for them to, for boys to have games. I said, I have looked at this boy in particular. I've looked at my son. It's like the perfect storm. You bring an environment that is ripe along with something that is ripe within someone. Perfect storm. Another child, you put them in a situation, it won't affect them. But you have to know the person and you have to know the environment because when you put them together, what could happen? So I thought, I'm not having games in my house. And what I had done with Maxine, we followed through with him and we said, no TV during the week, etc. Et so I put a plan in place. All right. I didn't just say, no, you'll be fine. Oh, no, you'll be fine. No, I put a plan in place. And the last one is actually follow through with that plan and prepare. So the wise virgins thought if the bridegroom is delayed, we will need more oil. They didn't just say, oh, we will need more oil. They actually went and bought the oil. So I actually created routines. I said no games. And as a result of that, we were adequately prepared. When he started in second school, he literally hit the ground running. It was not automatic. It's not because he's our son that he will behave like that and he will be successful. It was a preparation period by saying, by not being proud and saying, oh, my child will not behave like that. I'm burying her head in the sand and say, oh, no, 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 no. My child can never behave. Like no, you don't know. Perfect storm. Perfect storm. Okay. So those are the four things. Number one, identify the trends regarding that situation because storms come to everyone. Storms come to everyone, especially when the Holy Spirit begins to drop hints. It begins to drop in. Somebody comes and says something. He said, I reject in Jesus' name. The next day, you are having a casual conversation. It has nothing to do with that thing. Somebody says it again. And then, so it's, and then somebody says it again. Don't just dismiss it and assume that you are exempt. You have to prepare as if you are not exempt. Why? Because storms come to everyone. Storms come to everyone. So if the people that took on that role before you, they didn't last six months. But you, you are showing up and you're saying, it doesn't matter. They didn't know what they were doing, but I'm going to show up <laughs> and I'm going to blow everybody away. Why would you blow everybody away? What makes you special and better than the people that came behind you that flopped at that thing? It's, do you understand? You cannot approach life like that. You have to sit and say, 
oh, all the people that did that thing, that role before me, why did they fail? Don't automatically think, oh, because God sent me, I'm special. I'm the blood of Jesus is following me everywhere. I'm going to succeed. No. Survey the environment. Identify the trends. What tripped these people up? Step one. Step two, I can't mitigate against every eventuality. So you sit down and you reflect with the help of the Holy Spirit, which one in particular applies to me? Which one do I need to prepare for? Yeah. Identify one or two things that you need to mitigate against. Number three, create a plan. How would you respond if this thing happened? So walk it through in your mind. What is the worst case scenario? Don't be afraid to think of the worst case scenario because if you think of the worst case scenario in advance, you become prepared for it. You understand what I'm saying? So you think of the worst case scenario, then you walk backwards to create a plan to make sure that worst case scenario does not sweep you away. How do you either prevent it or if it can't be prevented, how do you deal with it? And number four is to follow through. So don't just create the plan and then abandon it. Follow through and actually put those things in place. The same way the wise virgins went and bought oil and made sure that they had extra oil. The same way the man that was building his house heard that the storm was coming. He didn't dismiss it. He decided to build his house on the rock. As Pentecostals, we assume too much. We're very quick to dismiss. And it's human nature, to be honest with you, because you never think anything bad is going to happen to you. I'm telling you, this is how I approach my life. <laughs> I don't assume anything because to assume if I learned from that, this thing that I shared with you, okay, about what my auntie said about how people gain weight and I didn't listen. Getting married, my husband and I, we didn't just say, oh, we just love each other and the grace of God is upon this marriage, etc., etc. Months before we sat down, we said, we're two different families are coming together. My husband and his son, me and my daughter coming together as a blended family. Is he yam like that? So we didn't just assume that, oh, everybody loves each other. The grace of God is upon this marriage. Oh, we walk in love. All these empty things that we say. Like, oh, God forbid, this marriage can never fail. No lie. So, oh, the children, are, they've known each other for, for a while now. So he would just gel. No, that's a different environment. They knew each other as friends, not as brother and sister. So months in advance, I'm telling you, this is what we did. We looked at the trend and thought, hmm, blended families or going into marriage. You have the complication of the issues of trying to mesh in marriage. You also have the fact that there are children involved as well. So we identified and we said, okay, now which one specifically applies to us, right? Which one specifically with the help of the Holy Spirit? And what did we do? in advance i went to the holy spirit and the holy spirit gave me scriptures about how he would knit the heart of every single one of us together i didn't wait until i had entered the marriage and then the storm now came and then i was now trying to build in the middle of the storm which is what a lot of us are doing we are dismissing all the warning signs just going forward then you enter the thing the storm now comes you're now looking for prayer partner and people to pray for you you are trying to build in the middle of a storm it is immensely difficult to build in the middle of the storm. You have to be prepared so that when the storm comes, you're just sitting down and enjoying your life. The storm blows and just basically sweeps past and you, you're safe. When to God, I received scriptures. I shared it with then my fiance and I said, this is what God showed me. So we began to pray. We began to declare that the Lord, you know, based on scripture, he knits. So that was the plan. And then we put it into action. And then we also decided, how are we going to practically do this thing? So one of the things we decided was we will treat every child as, so there's no preference. There's no, oh, I'm, I'm favoring this one. So we actually prepared. We had a plan in advance for, oh, if this could happen, how can we mitigate against it? You understand what I'm doing? Stop going into life bed chested. Stop going into new seasons of your life bed chested. You're starting a new job, a new role. 
you're getting married your child is going to secondary school or university or any of those things and you just assume that bad things only happen to other people stop living your life like that storms come to everyone the way you make sure that the storm does not sweep you away is to be adequately prepared using those four simple steps very four simple steps that i shared everything and anything that you are doing in your life okay make sure you do it especially when the warning signs are ringing so that is what i have come to share with you today thank you so much